the soldiers of World War II, there was nothing more terrifying than falling into the clutches of the enemy. But it was this intense fear and dehumanizing loss of dignity and freedom that triggered some of the most compelling dramas of the war. The real story behind the movie The Great Escape. Resistance fighters escaping torture or execution. Downed airmen evading Nazis deep behind the lines. And Germans escaping from prison camps in America. These are remarkable true stories of Great Escapes of World War II. Sabotage, terrorism, spying, assassination. This was the work of the resistance in occupied Europe in World War II. These were courageous civilians, both men and women who waged a secret war against the Nazis. They operated behind the enemy lines to support the Allied cause and win back freedom for their countries. The stakes for the resistance operatives were enormous. If they were caught, they would be facing torture and death. One critical mission for the resistance was to aid downed airmen who were attempting to evade capture. They established a complex network of communications, operatives, and safe houses, all designed to shelter and guide the Allied flyers to safety. These secret underground routes were called escape lines, with code names like the Comet Line, the O'Leary Line, and the Possum Line. But as effective as this system was, freedom was still a long shot. The airmen would literally have to walk hundreds of miles through enemy territory to reach a neutral country. In 1940, Winston Churchill recognized the value of clandestine warfare and created a special operations branch. Part of this team was an elite air unit called Flight 161, Special Duty Squadron. Their mission was to fly deep behind the lines and make parachute drops to the resistance, delivering food and supplies, guns and ammunition, and even special forces agents. This was the lifeline that kept the resistance alive and kept the escape routes open. To retrieve the downed airmen, 161 pilots would have to land in unmarked fields and pastures. These treacherous flights were guided only by the light of the moon. The dangers the pilots faced were enormous but they were deeply committed to their missions. In 1943, Hugh Verity, a former night fighter pilot, volunteered to join the squadron. By 1942, when I already had two children, um, the idea of them being under Nazi domination was unacceptable. You know, one just had to do what one could. 161 Squadron pilot Bob Hodges knew the importance of this operation firsthand. He was shot down in northern France and miraculously walked 800 miles to the Spanish border. I can remember very well when I was walking across the middle of France, heading towards the Pyrenees, I used to think if only an airplane could come and land in that field just there, how easy it would be. Little realizing that in Two years' time, or 18 months, I'd be in a squadron doing just that. But the secret of success in flying these operations depended not only on the skill of the pilots, but on the French agents who were charged with finding and preparing the fields for each landing. 
il fallait, premièrement, we needed a field of about one kilometer in length that could be secured easily. Security guards were positioned all around the field. One of the lucky men who benefited from the extraordinary efforts of 161 Squadron was air gunner Fred Gardner. Gardner was in a Lancaster bomber in August 1943 when it was shot down over Belgium. We were attacked by a Messerschmitt fighter and uh, shot down in flames. And four of us, fortunately, were able to bail out, but sadly, three, three of the crew were killed. When Gardner bailed out, the force of his chute opening left him barefoot in a field in the pitch black. He spent the night wrapped in his parachute, and at daylight he began walking, hoping to find help. After some while, with very painful feet, uh, I arrived in this little village, and going down the main street, I heard uh, some transport, a vehicle approaching. So I thought this was uh, likely to be Germans. The, the, the population generally didn't have motor cars. So I dived into the first cottage door I came to, and uh, very fortunately too, because uh, I looked from a window uh, alongside the door, and uh, a German uh, vehicle came past, a German army truck, uh, carrying soldiers with their rifles between their, their knees, and I'm sure that was a search party that had been sent out to uh, put a cordon round our crashed Lancaster. Arriving in the cottage, I was met by a, an elderly lady who burst into tears. I don't know whether that was because she was afraid or she was rather sorry for my appearance. I, I was rather battered. I had a black eye. I had uh, burned hair. Uh, I was barefoot. I had some bruises. And she called to a man in her room at the back. He brought me some clothing and shoes and suggested that I change into civilian clothes, which I did. I realized that I'd been very fortunate in choosing a cottage and people who were going to be sympathetic and would perhaps help me start on an escape. On the second day, Gardner was given a bicycle and escorted to the next village three miles away. By now, I was pretty desperate to get some sleep and there was a nice comfortable bed and I'd just got undressed and got into bed when a fellow charged in and said, you must leave at once. This is a collaborator's house and we must go straight away. Gardner was now under the wing of the resistance, but they had to be certain he wasn't an imposter. He was interrogated by a resistance operative. In fact, he gave me a sharp punch to gain some sort of response and I believe that had I exclaimed in German rather than English I would have given the game away had I been a German plant. Gardner was taken to a vicarage that night where the local priest put him up. The following night the priest gave Fred his cassock as a camouflage and after an exchange of coded whistles at a pre-arranged rendezvous spot he was left with a resistance man. This resistance man had shot some Germans in escaping from an ambush, and he was known and wanted by the Gestapo. So we were in rather a difficult position had we been arrested in the curfew. The men moved carefully through the woods, but suddenly they stumbled on a German military camp. As we approached some huts, one of the doors opened and the light streamed out and German soldiers came tumbling out. With their guns, um, my companion immediately pushed me down into the ditch and got down with me in the ditch at the side of the road and we waited there, crouched down while German soldiers mounted bicycles and came and cycled past us. I was concerned that we'd make a noise and had we coughed or 
or sneezed to attract the Germans' attention, I think my comrade would probably have fired, and that would have been the end of us. Gardner was now on the Possum escape line to Spain. For two weeks, he was carried through the pathways of their secret network. He was never told the true identities of the people helping him or where he would be going from one place to the next. All the people involved with handling me from village to village and house to house were, of course, risking their lives. I was very conscious of that because they could have been executed had they been caught whereas I may have got away with becoming a prisoner. Gardner was issued a false ID under the fictitious name of Jean-Joseph Jacques. He was taken by taxi and then escorted through the woods by a resistance woman across the Belgium-France border. There, another guide met him and took him to a railway station in the town of Sedan. While the guide bought the tickets, Fred was instructed to wait at a table at the restaurant. And we were joined at our table by German soldiers who put their rifles down against the end of the bench. And we had to keep very quiet. So we, we spoke, not at all, until our guide came from the ticket office, saw the situation and just beckoned us away. So we very quietly left. Gardner's luck stayed with him, and after a tense train ride, he got off at Reims. Fred Gardner had now been behind the lines for over a month. He had had incredibly good luck, and yet he was still over 500 miles from the Spanish border in freedom. His next stop was a safe house in Fien, where he was taken in by yet another family. And in fact, it was at that house that we were told we may be taken out of France by an aircraft which was coming in to bring agents and supplies for the resistance. We thought that was marvellous. That would be a, a wonderful thing. After several false alarms, Gardner was told there would be a flight on September 13th and to be ready to leave at 11 p.m. We walked in the darkness out to the landing field. We were told to keep very quiet and walk in line astern at a certain distance apart. And when we were some distance from the, from the landing strip, the aircraft arrived overhead. He was either early or we were late. The pilot for the operation circling overhead was Hugh Verity, and he was running out of time. If he didn't receive the proper signal soon, the mission would have to be scrapped. I was circling around, not exactly around the field, but I was coming back to the field every now and then to see if they were there. For about an hour, I had to wait. We ran the last quarter of a mile to this landing strip and set up the torches. And after another circuit of the landing strip, the pilot came in and I was instructed to give him the a safe landing signal and he came in and made a good landing and within a few seconds had taxied back to the starting point and within a minute or two we were airborne and on our way back and we came across the English Channel and across the English South Coast where I recognized a town where my grandmother was living and I could recognize her street and I'd been missing for several weeks and she did not know that I was safe, and perhaps considered that I was dead. After five weeks on the run, Fred Gardner was safely returned to England. But some of those who helped him were not as fortunate. The Burr family in Fiem, who sheltered him prior to his flight, were betrayed by their daughter to the Gestapo, and they were deported, never to be seen again. The agent in charge of the operation was a Belgian, Dominique Potier. Unfortunately, after doing a number of these operations, he was betrayed, captured, and uh, tortured so badly that he couldn't take it any longer, and he jumped out of a second floor window to kill himself. By the war's end, the Moon Squadron had flown over 650 passengers out of occupied France. 
and over 6,000 Allied airmen had successfully evaded capture. Behind each of these statistics is a dramatic story. But there is no escape story more daring or gripping than that of Lucy and Raymond Aubrec. As World War II continued, the activities of the resistance accelerated. But resistance workers always faced the specter of Nazi brutality and torture. If they were captured, they knew they were facing death. Escape was critical. At a safe house in southern England, Barbara Bertram and her husband Tony sheltered French intelligence agents en route to occupied France. More than 200 agents passed through her house and one woman told her firsthand about the Nazi practices. She told me about the torture and she said that she found, and most people agreed with her, that the little things were the worst, like pulling out their teeth pulling out their fingernails, sticking pins into their breasts. They were worse and more difficult to bear than the beatings and the near drownings, which they did a lot of. In spite of these terrifying dangers, resistance groups proliferated. In 1941, Lucy and Raymond Aubrac helped found the French resistance group Liberation Sud in Lyon, France. They had a baby son, Jean-Pierre, and Lucy was pregnant with their second child. Lucy was a teacher and Raymond was an engineer. Using their unassuming life as a cover, they quietly held meetings at their home on Avenue Esquirol. Although there were many resistance groups like the Obrax, in the early years of the war they were scattered and disorganized. The man most responsible for unifying the resistance groups under the banner of de Gaulle was Jean Moulin. In June 1943, Raymond and Lucy met with Jean Moulin, and Raymond was asked to head the secret army for the north of France. I was surprised and very proud to talk to the messenger of General de Gaulle. All I knew of Jean Moulin was two hours in my life, a handshake when I met him, and two hours later, another handshake, saying goodbye and see you tomorrow. There was never a tomorrow. On June 21st, Raymond and Jean Moulin met at the home of Dr. Frédéric Dugoujon, a prominent physician and friend of the resistance. Suddenly the house was surrounded by a troop of violent Gestapo men led by the notorious Gestapo chief, Klaus Barbie. We all were arrested. The Gestapo arrived with great brutality. They came up to the second floor and started breaking furniture and beating everyone. Then they put handcuffs on all of us. And then Jean Moulin, who was next to me at the time, asked me to take a paper out of his pocket and get rid of it. I ate it. It didn't taste very good. The prisoners were taken to the basement of the Gestapo headquarters. By day, they were interrogated. Their nights were spent at the horrific Montluc prison. Lucy and her resistance group knew that along with the interrogations would come torture. They worked feverishly to devise a plan to free the men. Jean Moulin was the one who had met all the leaders of the French resistance. He knew all the secret meeting places that the police hadn't discovered yet. It was very important to free him first. But the Gestapo's treatment of Jean Moulin was swift and brutal. One day, Raymond saw him through the hole in the door to his cell. It is through this hole that I saw Jean Moulin for the last time. 
He was going down to be interrogated, and he was being carried by two soldiers. He was covered with blood, and all his clothes were filthy and ripped. He had betrayed nothing and no one at a terrible price. It was too late to save him, but there was still time for Raymond. On June 23rd, Lucy dressed up in a disguise, carried false identity papers, and went to the Gestapo headquarters, posing as her husband's fiance. Surprisingly, Barbie himself agreed to see her. She pleaded with him to release Raymond, but Barbie would not budge. In fact, Barbie himself had been subjecting Raymond to interrogation and torture every day for a week. He would take a club-like stick and beat me on the head and back, repeating the same questions over and over again. During each interrogation, I fainted. Raymond had revealed nothing, and the Gestapo did not even realize that he was Jewish. But Raymond had been condemned to death, and Lucy knew time was running out. She and her group devised a daring scheme for saving Raymond. If Lucy could arrange a meeting with Raymond at Gestapo headquarters, the resistance group would know precisely when he would be returning to his cell. They would then ambush the van on its way back to prison. Lucy and her group swung into action to train for the attack. Meanwhile, Lucy's sister took their son, Jean-Pierre, to a children's home in the Vercors Mountains so Lucy could work full time on the escape. Lucy bribed two Germans to allow her to see Raymond. She convinced them that she had to be able to see her fiancé to ask him to marry her before he was executed. It was for the dignity of her unborn child. On September 19th, Raymond was brought to Gestapo headquarters. When he went into the office, Lucy was there. Alors, pendant un instant, j'ai pensé évidemment qu'elle était arrêtée. At first, I thought that Lucy had been arrested. But then I saw that she was dressed up in a beautiful hat and a new dress. The Gestapo officer was very polite to her, and I understood at that point that something else was happening. Lucy convincingly played the part of the seduced and abandoned woman, and the Gestapo bought her act. With a parting wink from Lucy, Raymond knew an escape was brewing. In preparation for the ambush, weapons had been smuggled in from Switzerland, and every detail of the operation had been nailed down. Lucy and her group were ready. We were waiting for that van in the streets of Lyon at 6.30, the night of the attack. We shot the driver and the German soldier sitting next to him, as well as the Germans sitting in the back. The Gestapo soldiers had been told that in the event of an attack on the street, they should kill all the prisoners immediately. When Lucy attacked the van, the German officers hesitated to shoot us. Instead, they jumped out of the truck to fight with our friends. My fellow prisoners and I leaped off the van and escaped. We went too fast, and I was shot in the cheek. Raymond and the 14 other prisoners were rushed into waiting cars and taken to the hiding places that had been arranged for them. Within hours of the raid, the streets of Lyon were crawling with SS. The success of the operation had made Raymond and Lucy genuine time bombs. Anyone near them was at risk of being blown up. And Lucy was now five months pregnant. In the following weeks, Lucy and Raymond were sheltered by the resistance as plans were set in motion to fly them out of France. But on November 4th, they received terrifying news. The Gestapo had found out where their son was and were going to the Vercors to get him. The idea that he could be taken by the Germans and that we could not do anything about it was terrifying beyond words. 
Lucy's resistance group raced to the Vercors to rescue their son and arrived there before the Gestapo. Lucy and Raymond awaited him breathlessly in their hiding place. Raymond opened the door and our son ran into his arms. I don't wish that anyone should ever have their child taken by the enemy. On November 7th, the Aubrac family was introduced to Paul Rivière, the agent responsible for mounting the air operation to get the family to England. But the November, December, and January moon periods passed, and each time the operations fell through. Paul Rivière coordinated efforts with Hugh Verity's squadron. Finally, on February 8th, a twin-engine Hudson was dispatched to the airfield where the Obrax and their son were waiting. Lucy was now nine months pregnant and was in danger of going into labor on the flight. Pendant deux mois, le terrain était tout à fait sec. Two months before this operation, the landing strip was very dry and frozen. Then the weather started warming up and the airstrip became very soggy. The Hudson landed on the field at midnight, but when the pilot tried to take off with the Obrax on board, the plane wouldn't budge. Its port wheel had got stuck in the, in the mud, axle deep in the mud, and they got horses and oxen from their local farms tied onto the undercarriage, and they couldn't pull it out of the mud. The pilot wanted to burn the airplane, but I refused. I told him that we would try to get the plane off the ground. The reception committee ran to the nearby village to get help. Soon there were 50 people on the field. They woke up the farmers who were warm in their beds with their wives, and the wives said to their husbands, just go. And we can never say enough that those were the heroic acts of the resistance movement. Finally, after a three-hour struggle, the plane took off, bound for freedom. The Hudson arrived in England at 7 a.m. Raymond and Lucy and Jean-Pierre were finally safe. Three days later, on February 12th, Lucy gave birth to her daughter, Catherine. For Lucy and Raymond, the resistance did not just exist for a particular period of time, but it was a way of life. Sometimes you have to be heroic and use a weapon. But the most important weapons of the French resistance movement were the refusal of the Nazi occupation, information and solidarity. The debate continues on the effect of the resistance on the military outcome of the war. I think it made a, a great contribution, and particularly in the run-up to the Normandy landings which took place in 1944, uh, the resistance forces played a major part in uh, harassing the Germans, uh, in interfering with their uh, reinforcement of the Normandy battlefield uh, by blowing up railways and that sort of thing. Was the French resistance a determining factor in winning the war? I don't think so. I think that the war against Nazism was won by the Allies by the British, by the Americans, the Russians, and the Africans in the French army. The main contribution of the French resistance was to maintain the honor of our country and its people. The struggle for Allied prisoners to win their freedom is an inspirational and well-documented story of World War II. But what of the vanquished soldiers of the Axis powers? Thousands of German, Italian, Japanese, and even Finnish soldiers were captured during the war, and their story was a little-known chapter among the momentous events of the great conflict. 
Their loss of freedom was no less devastating than that of any other prisoner of war. When a soldier lays down his arms, he is completely at the mercy of the capital. And it all depends who takes you captive. He can actually do with you, and, and if he shoots you, who, who is going to Who's going to say he, he shot you in cold blood? For the first time in U.S. history, the nation was faced with having hundreds of thousands of foreign enemy prisoners of war on American soil. Over 500,000 of America's defeated enemy lived and worked within nearly 500 camps across the United States. Each state in the continental U.S. had at least one camp, and there was also camps in the uh, territory of Alaska. One of the reasons why the prisoners were brought over to the United States was that President Roosevelt saw the value in using the prisoners as a substitute labor force, because during World War II, virtually every American was involved in the war effort in some way, either directly in the military or in a war-related uh, job. POWs were interrogated by U.S. intelligence officers from the moment of capture to their arrival in American prison camps. Well-disciplined German captives were generally tight-lipped, so listening devices and spies were incorporated to extract information. Unlike prisoners of war around the world, those held in the U.S. were well-fed, kept in clean quarters, and were paid for the work they performed. Indeed, they were some of the luckiest soldiers in the war. We marched into the compound, and each barracks had uh, 25 cots on either side. And the cots were decked with bed sheets, pillows, toiletry, shaving cream, a toothpaste, everything. And this gave me a lift. I thought, that looks promising. American POW camps served to deprogram young Nazis and introduce them to the idea of freedom. Prisoners were given books prepared by the U.S. government, which explained our democratic society. When they went outside the camps to work, many POWs had contact with civilians and learned firsthand what America was all about. They got out, they got to look at some pretty girls, and there were women all around here at the time I thought these were some of the most handsome men they'd ever seen. Uh, most of the others were all off the war, and these guys would work out here without their shirts on. They were well tanned. They were an attraction. While German prisoners led a relatively pampered existence, most of them held the same burning desire for freedom as their Allied counterparts. One of the more illustrious captives was U-boat captain Jürgen Wattenberg, a career naval officer and recipient of the German Iron Cross. The 42-year-old Wattenberg had already escaped a prison camp in South America and was back in action commanding U-boat U-162. On the afternoon of September 3rd, 1942, while on patrol in the Caribbean, off the coast of South America, Wattenberg and the crew of the U-162 encountered the British destroyer Quentin. The one destroyer soon became three as the attack on the near helpless U-162 began. After absorbing near direct hits from depth charges, the U-boat dove to 200 meters where she began to take on water. After six hours with the sub hanging almost vertically down from the surface, Captain Wattenberg ordered the crew to don their life preservers. The crippled U-162 could hold on no longer as the Germans were forced to surface. Wattenberg and his crew quickly swam away from the sinking sub, which took two of their comrades to the bottom. The destroyers surrounding the scene hoped to salvage the U-boat. Powerful searchlights found only the 48 survivors of U-162's crew, bobbing in the warm tropical waters. Emser, we were überrascht, 
We were surprised how helpful they were when they rescued us. I had to climb the rope ladder up, and we were all pretty exhausted. Of course, I was happy that we were being saved, and that we were being treated well once we were taken on. I must say, I was surprised how well we were treated. First held and interrogated on the island of Trinidad, the U-162 crew was transferred to various POW camps in the U.S. Now a prisoner for the second time in the same war, Captain Wattenberg became obsessed with escape. Like the Allied POWs, it was the duty of every German prisoner under the Geneva Convention to try and escape from the American camps. Realizing that escape was part of the game, American authorities rarely punished captured German escapees and indeed did little to increase security at the camps. German POWs in the U.S. were easy to recapture, for there was really nowhere for them to go. If you waited realistically, there was no chance to ever get out of the American states, North or South America. So I never had the wish to break out. Despite the hopelessness of actually reaching home, many of the men held in U.S. camps, like prisoners anywhere, simply had to get out. Captain Wattenberg was one of those men. After a few escape attempts at various camps, Wattenberg was transferred to the Papago Park camp just outside Phoenix, Arizona. The captain was joined at Papago by U-162 crewmen Walter Koser and Johann Kramer, men who had earned a reputation as escapers. Soon after being reunited, the U-boaters agreed that digging a tunnel was their best way out of this new prison in the Arizona desert. Finding a blind spot out of sight of Camp Guard Towers, the Germans dug through solid rock six feet down and worked in teams of three on a tunnel to freedom. An electric cord ran from the bathhouse to provide light and the men built a small cart to haul dirt out of the shaft. The submariners averaged three feet a night, but when harder rock was encountered, sometimes only a few inches of progress was made. To hide a lot of the dirt coming out of this tunnel, the uh, Germans asked the Americans permission to make a uh, Faustball court in their compound. Faustball is sort of a German version of volleyball. So they were able to hide a lot of the dirt in making this the sports area. Because fortunately for the Germans, the soil underground was the same color as the soil on the surface. So a lot of the dirt from the tunnel was taken and put into this um, Faustball court and also in their gardens, and a lot of it was also flushed down toilets. Aiming for a canal bed outside the fence at Papago, Wattenberg and his men had nearly completed the 180-foot-long tunnel by mid-December 1944. The plan was now to present the Americans with a Christmas Eve surprise that they would never forget. December 23rd, 1944. Wearing dyed prison clothes and each carrying a knapsack and a plan, 25 German POWs prepared to go through the tunnel and into the harsh desolation of the Arizona desert. Wattenberg and the other prisoners hoped that the holiday would provide them with a head start. At the Christmas Eve time, there were many of the American personnel who would go off on Christmas leave. And consequently, they would have limited staffing there. They knew that there would be only one inspection, one uh, roll call on Sunday. So uh, this was planned with the idea that the schedule suited their needs. As well as the Christmas celebration, POWs at Papago threw a loud, raucous party to commemorate the advance of the German army in the Battle of the Bulge. The drunken prisoners broke bottles and brawled with each other, diverting the attention of the tower guards away from the escape. The group of 25 Germans broke up into teams of two or three men and moved through the tunnel. Emerging in a torrential rainstorm, most of the food they carried was ruined. Wading through the canal to hide their tracks, the group now broke up and followed a wide range of plans and destinations. 
three of the prisoners, three of the escapees who didn't like the idea of having to march through this, this long, hot desert uh, on foot. And so their plan, they had stolen a map, an Arizona map from a U.S. Army vehicle, and it showed that the Gila River was, it was a blue line on the map that flowed into the Colorado River, which then flowed into the Gulf of California. So their plan is they built a three-man kayak inside of the camp and the three boatmen went off to the Gila River and much to their dismay, they discovered that the Gila River was indeed not a flowing river, but a series of puddles. And one of the boatmen said, everybody in Arizona knew the Gila wasn't a flowing river, but we didn't know that. We saw this blue line on this map and just assumed that this was a, a flowing river. Most of the escapees headed south toward the Mexican border. A few only lasted one night in the Arizona desert and turned themselves in to local police. U-162 crewmen Johan Kramer and Walter Kozer followed their captain and headed north into the sanctuary of the local mountains. Jürgen Vandenberg told uh, Walter Kozer and Johan Kramer, who were with him, that they would go north into the mountains. He said, we will live like Indians. So Vandenberg said, we'll go and try and find a cave in the mountains. He had discovered this, where we are now, this uh, indentation that was eroded. It made a good cave. They built up these huge boulders in front. These are some of the boulders they picked up and put here. Whatever we did, we were only able to do at night. You would never be able to do anything during the day because if a farmer saw anybody snooping around, they would immediately call the sheriff. I read this in the book called Biking Through the Wild West. You can't just go from the street into the fields and pitch a tent. You can't do that in America. Before the escape, Wattenberg had arranged for a drop-off point for prison work crews to leave messages and food for the escapees. During the time of the escape, I was in Camp 4, and every day we would drive out to the arsenal in a truck convoy. In the arsenal, there was an area where cars were repaired. We would put food and supplies into an abandoned car. News of the escape made headlines across the country as the Germans became wanted men around Phoenix, Arizona. Local papers printed photos of the escapees, helping the police and nervous civilians to identify the enemy in their midst. Wattenberg translated news articles to his two crewmen, reading the names of those U-boaters who had been recaptured. Soon, they were the only ones left, hiding and surviving in the cave. Back at Papago Park, the Americans were not having a Merry Christmas. Many of the camp guards were called back early from holiday leave as the army scrambled to recapture the 25 Germans and find out how they had escaped. Suspecting a tunnel, search details combed the camp both inside and out. While patrolling along the canal just outside the fence, Private First Class Lawrence Jorgensen discovered the camouflaged exit to the U-boater's tunnel. Foolishly, I said, well, it would be nice to know what was the inside of that tunnel. And uh, they didn't know how far it was. And I was to, to crawl through the tunnel then, which was only as wide as a man's shoulder. And if you ever saw blackness, I saw it. And I know, brother, here in the dark, I gotta crawl out of this thing. Prison work crews who had been leaving food in the abandoned car left the three escapees a note indicating a new drop-off point. When Johann Kremer could not find the new hiding place and with the Germans' food supply running low, the young sailor decided he would sneak back into the camp, get some supplies, and then re-escape to return to the cave. There were 30 or 40 prisoners working there outside of the camp. So I knew if I mingled with these men during the day, then in the evening when they were done working, you could return to the camp with them. And that's how I got back into the camp. 
Kramer's luck ran out on January 23rd when he was discovered during a surprise camp inspection. He had been a free man for exactly one month. The next evening, Walter Kozer was captured, leaving Captain Wattenberg the last of the 25 Germans to remain free. Cold, hungry, and alone, the proud U-boat commander left his mountain sanctuary and walked toward downtown Phoenix. It was January 28th, 1945, a Saturday night. Wattenberg walked past several hotels, blinded by the flashing neon lights against the Arizona sky. Unable to get a room in a city packed with American soldiers on leave, Wattenberg spent his remaining cash on a Chinese dinner and then found a comfortable chair in the lobby of the Hotel Adams, where he fell fast asleep. Wattenberg uneasily awoke around 1.30 a.m. Sunday morning and decided to head for the train station. Then, in the early morning hours, the end of uh, January of 1945, asked directions of a street worker, the uh, directions to the, uh, to the Phoenix train station. The man's uh, German accent alerted this street worker who then contacted a member of the Phoenix police who then confronted Wattenberg, and Wattenberg then had admitted who he was. The captain returned to camp to the cheers of his countrymen. After a hearty meal at the Papago Hospital, Wattenberg was transferred to the stockade and placed on bread and water. The result of this escape from the standpoint of the Americans was that there was a congressional investigation called for. Walter Winchell uh, broadcast it uh, rather flamboyantly, and it caused a great, great commotion in the press across the country. And the uh, officer, one of the officers, was uh, charged with being delinquent in supervising. And the commanding officer retired shortly after that on medical disability. When the war ended, German prisoners were not immediately set free. They were sent around the globe to help repair the damage the Nazi war machine had caused. Jürgen Wattenberg was reunited with his wife and children on June 16, 1946 in his home port of Neustadt on the Baltic Sea. Ja, so, das wurde dann auch, uh, Normally, as kids, we knew that the largest and the richest and the most beautiful country was America. Who didn't want to go there? Every child's dream was to go there. But I never dreamed that I would see America as a prisoner of war. And even though I had been a prisoner, it was still very revealing because you would remember the feelings that you had as a kid and you would say to yourself, it's good to be here, but I am a prisoner. But even so, it was quite an experience. I was happy and lucky to have seen America and then to have been able to return back home.